Astra Travelers, and welcome to another episode of Tales of Tavat, a Genshin lore podcast. Last week, we turned pages through the Genshin manga and discussed the origins of the Dandelion Knight, Vanessa. After dusting off the pages and using some animo to find lore tidbits in the game, we're curious to see if Vanessa will pop up again in Natlon. This week, we're going to be talking about the Yakshas. Before we jump into it, I want to remind travelers to visit TalesOfTavat.com to see visual representations of the lore mentioned during today's podcast. Your guides have put them together to make things a little easier for you to understand. Additionally, this week, we'd like to take a moment to thank our dear friends Mason, Sirens Groom Art on Instagram for making our kick-ass cover art, and Johnny Bailey on Instagram, Spotify, and Twitch for creating our amazing intro and outro music you've heard in all of our episodes. These are two amazing people that we have found through our community, and we highly recommend checking them out. We've dropped all their information in today's episode description. Uh, We just want them to know that we really appreciate and love you both. Now, with love and admiration aside, let's jump into the Yakshas. Our first introduction to the Yakshas is Emo Boy Zhao. So emo. He's so emo. Okay. I'm I'm gonna fight this a little bit because <laughs> he's not just a sad boy emo boy. Like sad emo boy. Come on. I mean he has a reason. He has a valid reason to be. He's suffering from PTSD, y'all. Yeah. That's true, yes. I mean, but to be truly emo, it has to come from somewhere. So <laughs> <laughs> all emos have an origin story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got yeah, you gotta have, you know, the trauma. <laughs> you know, I believe the first time we actually meet Zhao is when he rescues us during the finale of Leeway. And I know Brandon will remember this, but when I was playing the finale, I was doing it with him and I was really upset at the whole child like going against me thing. And the second I saw Zhao like pick us up and rescue us, I went, this is my rebound. (laughs) I was like, this is the man I'm going to rebound with. No! Uh (laughs) Yeah, I don't, and I don't know if that was his first entrance i feel like he was in the game before then yeah when we're doing the quest for zhongli to get basically the send-off of the body of rex lapis that was sorry spoilers we go to wangshu in basically to ask him figure out where a particular bowl is i think and he helps us with the ritual of like sending off the god of or i don't remember that at all Ooh, I don't know why I remember that. Maybe it was because it was fucking tedious. <laughs> well, Feeny, you were probably, the only thing you remember from Leeway is probably child because you were so enamored. I was so enamored by him. It was it's so like, dumb. Ooh, <laughs> who is Leo? It was cute. The whole time I was just shipping Lumine and child. I was like, oh, they're really cute. Oh, they're adorable. And then he ripped my heart out. <laughs> I mean, he got us back with with his story his story quest with Tuser. I don't know when when Zhao comes in and like just grabs the traveler. Shit. And also, we'll absolutely believe that Zhao has like a vi- like tiny baby crush on the traveler because the only person who who he responds to when they call his name is the traveler, not Paimon, not Hu Tao, is the traveler. I think it's safe to say that everybody has a slight crush on traveler like it kind of comes across with every time and it could be a part of their whole origin too like maybe it is that you know i I think we mentioned in the last episode or a few episodes ago that they they smell of the stars maybe that's something that's very attractive to people and it's like a pheromone almost and people are just automatically but they always seem to be very like over the moon about them Boyovers has done a great job of making it a very open-minded ship game. So you really can ship whoever you want. And specifically to travelers, they have done an amazing job with that. I mean, even Zhao Ether has a ton mm-hmm. of ships going on. Lots of content. Yeah. But to Al's point, I will say that it does seem that there's something... The story definitely gives you the feeling that there's something special going on between Traveler and Zhao, just because Traveler is one of the only people that seems to be able to change Zhao's mind or to soothe him a little bit in his mm-hmm. angst, so I get that. For our Travelers listening in, too, one of the things Zhao says is, just call my name and I'll be there to the Traveler in Paimon, and that is something we've seen proven quite a few times throughout the game. Do you guys think that he only does that for Traveler? I don't 
No, I mean, I was under that impression too, but I don't know if that's actually true. His job is to protect Li Wei, really. I mean, his whole job with Zhang Li is to be there for Li Wei. So I can imagine that if it's anybody who's also fighting for that same end, he would be that ready for them. But I think in that same respect, there is a little bit of a special place for Traveler and for Zhang Li. And they're probably the ones he's going to pick up their phone call first. I was always curious about that because you see a lot of fan fiction and fan comics where Zhao answers to other people too and obviously fan stuff isn't canon even though I'd love it to be sometimes so I was just curious what you guys thought because I've definitely been swayed by fan fictions into thinking that he probably does that for other people but I'm not sure what's actually canon there nah I mean, I think there might be a moment. I'd have to look at one of the Lantern Right cutscenes. I think the only other person that might, like, be able to call Zhao and he responds other than, you know, us and Zhongli. People who would be on his, like, top priority list might be Hu Tao. You, you just, like, awoken something in me, Al. Oh, no. You don't think, like, Ganyu too? I can't remember if it was Hu Tao or Ganyu in that cutscene, though. Because... There's that time where <laughs> when we run across Zhao just randomly standing in a field in Liyue. So it's the second story that involves Ningguang and the Jade Chamber. We see him just kind of standing in a field. And like, I think she's there then too at the end. And I think that might even run into the lantern right piece. Like we just see him kind of like hanging about and Ganyu shows up as well. Okay, interesting. Whether or not he does it for anyone else, it seems like he should be able to do it for anyone that he wants to and we know that he can teleport it seems like because he just disappears and appears places so he has the ability to do it for everyone the question is does he do it for anyone else Mm -hmm. yeah who's he actually willing to do it for Because Zhao has a very hard exterior, but overall he seems very soft. I feel like the people of Wang Shu In, he's very open to. Even in his lines about like Hu Tao, he says that she's very humorous. You don't need to worry about her growing boring. He seems to have a soft spot for humans, which I think is nice. So he might do it for others. He's very resigned to his pain (laughs) in a way (laughs) where he's not like fighting it necessarily. He just sort of accepts it. I almost wish he had uh, mental toward Kale in the manga. (laughs) Oh, shit. That would have been awesome. I mean, it would be very sad, though, because it definitely seems like he's disassociated in order to survive. Yeah, definitely. I can't remember where it stated, but there's there's a moment where it said that the Yakshas, they feel emotion, but they're not allowed to feel hatred or something like that. Zhao's distance that he has with mortals, even though he does have a soft spot, I think might be because of like all the PTSD. And he's lived centuries, so he's obviously seen multiple mortals live and die. And so people he've been he's been attached to. I mean, he's lost his entire family. Which brings me back to what exactly are the Yakshas, who are Zhao's family as well in this case. So from what we know about Zhao, or what we've assumed about Zhao through previous conversations, is that Zhao was possibly an adeptus who was enslaved by an unknown god. This unknown god made Zhao do horrible, terrible things. And one day, Zhang Li came along, free him and forced Zhao as well as four other main Yakshas into a contract with him to defend Li Wei. Yeah, so Zhao's, before his name was Zhao, he went by something else and he was enslaved by this unknown god. Not to be confused with the unknown god, but <laughs> just some random evil god in the world and was considered that god's bloodhound and was forced to kill all kinds of people, gods, I don't know, even as specific to detail that he would devour their dreams, which is the reason that he likes almond tofu so much because the texture of it reminds him of the sweet dreams he used to devour, which is very disturbing. I have so many questions about that. (laughs) That is the most disturbing. Like, why do dreams have the texture of almond tofu? Yeah, so the Zhongli frees him from this evil god and actually gives him his name of Zhao. And then I'm not sure if that's like the same moment that he summons all the Yaksha and, you know, enters into a contract with them or if that's later but uh, that was one thing i did not know before 
researching. And a quick reminder for our travelers, Morax and Zhongli are the same person. They are the Geo Archon of Li Wei, and that also makes them the Archon of Contract. And Zhongli's contracts are a pain in the ass 90% of the time for a traveler, but some of the contracts are also really important, such as this one, as Zhao is the only Yaksha left, and he is still following the contract to this day. And I believe Ganyu is also in a contract with Zhongli. I'm not sure if her contract is ended or not, but she chooses to still follow him. The fact that Zhongli had all five of these like Yakshas sign into a contract is really important for Zhongli and his character arc too. That's also why he gives his Gnosis willingly to Senora because they had a contract, right? Right. My one question is, in all of our research, did anyone find anything stating the origins of the other four Yakshas? Because I didn't. No, there was nothing about their origins. When Zhongli summoned all the Yakshas, there were a lot of them. And Zhao and four others just became the five foremost Yakshas. So they were basically just like leaders of the pack. They were just the strongest ones out of all the others. Okay, interesting. So the Yakshas then were all, now we have five Yakshas. They were all in contract with Zhongli. And they are fighting against the monsters that were released after the cataclysm? I don't think it was the cataclysm. So they talk about karmetic debt and... In the Zhao teaser trailer, Zhongli is narrating that the land was swept in this miasma, and that miasma came from the festering dead bodies of gods. So I think it's more along the lines of the Archon War rather than the Cataclysm. Because why would there be dead bodies of gods still around and festering? These are, This is obviously a bit more recent, and that's also part of the karmatic debt because all of this like miasma infected, created, and mutated a bunch of creatures, which includes the Pyro Regivine, which is very interesting. Can I just ask real quick, what is miasma? And is that a real world, <laughs> like an IRL word or game yeah. word? <laughs> it means an oppressive or unpleasant atmosphere which surrounds or emanates from something. Also considered an unpleasant or unhealthy smell or vapor. In the 19th century, like during Queen Victoria's time, when, when they were talking about cholera, uh, they would, before they knew what it was, which is like bacteria in, in water, they thought it was a miasma um, that basically airborne particulates that would i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure an aphrodisiac is the same thing as a miasma but specifically for like lust so a miasma is like something airborne that causes you to change your emotions or to change your feelings hold up hold up hold hold up what aphrodisiac are you smoking mm -hmm. because all the aphrodisiacs i quote unquote know is like food related <laughs> that you eat the only aphrodisiacs i know are on ao3 oh, oh my god, my god. <laughs> <laughs> we can't go to AO3 for our lore stuff. This is just not. <laughs> I'm not I mean, it's not lore stuff. It's just like a, the, my best way to explain it's it. It's just smart. Like an aphrodisiac is something in the air that can change your vibe and change your feeling. <laughs> that right. only happens in anime and porn. Like, come on. That's fine by me. <laughs> the miasma in this, in this context is really just like a poison that's emanating from the bodies of dead gods during the Archon War. So they were all summoned during the Archon War. And as gods were being killed, since they're immortal, their spirit lingers on. And all these dead gods were so bitter about being defeated that it poisoned the land around their bodies and created, Al was saying, this like all kinds of demons and weird occurrences and mutations. That's why Zhongli summoned the Yakshas to help fight with all of this, because there were demons everywhere suddenly and the land was poisoned poisoned and all of this stuff. So that was sort of their mission was to fight against this poison that resulted from the Archon War and all of these dead gods everywhere. Yeah. Think of it very much like Miasma from Inuyasha that's associated with Naraku. Yeah, absolutely. But Zhao and the Yakshas willingly take on this role, even though that particular festering of that energy and that, like, poison is corrupting them. Like, it's legitimately harming them, which, you know, makes sense. It's, it's a poison. But they they do it specifically as a, or at least Zhao does it in order to pay back everything he has done under the god we don't know the name of, and all kind of, like, the atrocities he was forced to do yeah that's what that's when they talk about karmic 
debt, which they use that phrase for, I think, all the four, the five foremost yakshas, which is interesting because to, to one degree, they're all killing machines. Like they're just going around killing, killing, killing. So that creates, I guess, a karmic debt for them in general. But then they're also being poisoned by the miasma, which is seeping into their souls and torturing them. Yeah, exactly. It's, I think it's safe to assume that the other yakshas were part of the imprisonment Zhao was under because they all have a similar vein of they're trying to right the wrongs that they've already done and so they're constantly pushing themselves into this and so I think that's why they name it karmic debt that this idea of, of this corruption leaking into their souls because we see it when Zhao alts we see him pull his mask and we see that very dark aura come around and when we'll go into later bits of uh, Bosatius and what we find in the chasm. That's actually why Zhao's burst makes his HP go down. It's supposed to be a nod to the fact that he's using like the karmic powers of being a Yaksha. Exactly. And that it's, he, it's, it's hurting him. But no, I think that this is great. I think we have a great basis now for exactly what a yaksha is and what Zhao as the final yaksha is going through. Now, I also understand after doing Zhao's storyline, which never seemed to end, every day there was a new little bit to it, because we were building out pervasuses. Pervasuses? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, We were building out a shrine to honor him. And we find out that Pervasus was actually a Yaksha as well. But he was considered a junior Yaksha. So it seems that there were quite a few junior Yakshas as well underneath the main five. Who were training up and trying to become, you know, baby Zhao's. (laughs) Yeah. In in the teaser trailer, Zhongli specifically says that the foremost Yakshas are the Pyro, Geo, Electro, Hydro, and Animo. So there, of course, is the five, but we have two other, if not more, elements that aren't represented. So it makes sense that they might be a different element that just wasn't part of, like, you know, the main team in a way. So we have these Yakshas and we also have Zhongli, and we have this almost like father son relationship that is now grown through Zhongli and Zhao. And I love it. I'm here for it. And I think a lot of that is confirmed in the Perilous Trails event that come, came out with the chasm or i should say it came out as the part two of the chasm storylines yeah at first when zhang li saves zhao at the end of that was kind of like because i know a lot of people are like oh i'm so grateful that zhang li saved him oh and, and i was kind of like well zhang li's the asshole that made zhao fight a bunch of demons for thousands of years so mm-hmm. yeah he should save him but then i discovered the story that zhang li also essentially rescued Zhao from an evil god way back when before all that so yeah I also wasn't aware until the chasm quest regarding Zhao that Zhongli had saved Zhao as well and then my game bugged and I never saw that end scene and I had to like YouTube it later on when I heard you guys talking about it I was like what the hell are they talking about Zhongli didn't save anyone we just like got out of there somehow (laughs) and then I was like oh my god I missed the whole cutscene (laughs) <laughs> that was like beautiful. You know, once you actually understood everything, it was a beautiful scene. It was really sad too. And then Zhang Li tries to play dumb when you run into him later on. It's like, I was here the whole time drinking Osman's this wine. <laughs> it was one of his other five other alter egos. <laughs> in Perilous Trails, we run into Yan Fei, who is in the chasm looking for an artifact of sorts for someone in a will and testament. We later find out that the item she is looking for was created by Ye Lan's ancestor, as well as an Zhao's almost brother, Yaksha, as uh, they say in the little cutscene, Bodacious. Not so- Bodacious. Boda- <laughs> it's Bodacious. I like Bodacious better. <laughs> also, they didn't create... So the artifact wasn't actually created by Yelan's ancestor and the Adeptus Bosatius. It was actually created by an Adeptus named Seagazer, which I think is mentioned in Shenha's story, maybe. That was eventually given to Yelan's ancestor, I believe. Boyang is, is his name. And Boyang took it into the chasm during the cataclysm to fight the abyssal monsters that were flooded in that's also when bosatius showed up yeah and bos bosatius at that point had been known as like the missing yaksha and there was rumor in 
currently way that a mysterious yaksha had showed up to fight but no one could ever confirm who it was so when we're in the chasm working with yanfei looking for this item we also run into zhao who seems to be on his own personal mission to find out what exactly happened to bosatius now that the chasm has reopened and people can explore it again or you know certain people can explore it again and he actually gets permission from Zhang Li to go into the chasm and do his adventure. Right. And he's looking for Bosatius because Bosatius was one of the five foremost Yakshas, along with Andarius, Bonanus, and Monagius, and of course, Zhao. And, you know, we already knew that Andarius, Bonanus, and Monagius were dead and that Bosatius was missing. And we find out that back at the end of the Archon War, uh, Zhao actually witnessed Bosatius lose his mind before he disappeared. So the reason he's curious to go down and explore the chasm is because of these stories that, you know, 500 years ago during the Cataclysm, there was some unnamed Yaksha running around beating up all these abyssal monsters. And he wanted to go do this research to find out, was that bosatious? And I guess he just never had a chance in the last 500 years. So he happens to be doing it now. Yeah, he's like looking for his closure. Right, right. Emo boy things. But in the chasm, Zhao also gets hurt. So while we're on this story quest, we can hear Zhao because we're in some weird like dimensional tear. It's really weird. I don't know exactly how to explain it. But when we do eventually summon Zhao by calling his name, he is really injured and his injuries are wild they look like you can see like a green version of the abyss inside of his wound that i think is like the miasma the karmetic debt because Mm. it's very similar to part of the particles we see when he does his burst Mm -hmm. i could be wrong but i think maybe going into the chasm there might be a thicker miasma I mean, due to the fact that there are probably bodies down there that they hadn't really realized because it was so deep underground. Maybe it's the the energy of Bosatius being basically influenced through the entire chasm that he's picking up on, and it's kind of like killing him as it killed the other three. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, maybe it really was sort of triggering his threshold, like, or lowering his threshold of, you know, holding that karmic debt at bay, and it was sort of overtaking him. I don't actually remember how they explained his wounds in the story, so I'm not sure. They don't. (laughs) <laughs> they just don't simple don't. as that yeah they do not and they do not describe his wounds and they make it sound like some weird chasm monster attacked him the chasm is horrifying i don't ever want to go back <laughs> down there i did my 100 percenting and got the fuck out now we got the rune serpent to, to far. no yes you know, there's a bunch of weird spirits in there because they are attacking the team later when they're ascending from the, the floor of the chasm. So I'm sure he was being attacked by those on his way down, maybe. So eventually for travelers who haven't done the quest or need a reminder, Zhao is able to build up his energy and Kuki, Ido, Ushi? Ushi. Oh, Ushi. What, also, what does Ido call Zhao? Little guy? <laughs> yeah, little buddy, little guy. Like. Little buddy? <laughs> hey, little buddy. And then he meets Zhao and he's like, oh shit, he's scary. <laughs> Ito is the dumbest and the funniest, and I love him so much, but he doesn't know. He's been in this Zumba his entire life. How would how the fuck is he gonna Where is the Ito Zhao like buddy cop? Oh my yes. god. <laughs> yes. I need it now. <laughs> Ito comes over, puts his sunglasses down, he's like, hey, it's me. Good cop Ito. And Zhao's like, shut the fuck up. You don't tell them that you're the good cop. He's like, what's wrong with you, hombre? And Ushi just coming by (laughs) doing the booty dance. So all of our people, Yelana too, I don't think I said her originally, we all continue on and we go through these crazy domains where we keep changing where we are and there's a clock and it's wild and we find this artifact. And as we go to use it to get out, Zhao and Yelan have to combine their powers as the only, Yelan's like the only human there for some reason, but it's also (laughs) her ancestor. And Zhao, whose an- who's quote-unquote ancestor Bosatius, also passed using the tool. The two of them work together to help them get out, and they start to rise up on this like beautiful elemental elevator of sorts. And there's a shield around them that Zhao has created, and they are being attacked by these spirits that Brandon is talking about. And everyone's pretty scared shitless the whole time. Do you think that those spirits are also the spirits of these dead gods causing the karma? I interpreted those as 
the spirits of the abyssal monsters but i don't it could also just be a bunch of dead like millilith and other like you know more innocent people but i just since they were attacking i i assume they were more demonic or okay. at least abyssal it could be like these are just all the spirits of of multiple different people it could be the abyssal monsters it could be the demons or it could just be the innocent people but the miasma and the chasm has kind of corrupted them to the point that they are demonic mm. we know that um that boyong and bosatius originally activated the it's called the fantastic compass <laughs> fantastic not to be confused <laughs> with the moderately okay compass right <laughs> it was the fantastic <laughs> compass and that's what is sort of bending space in the bed of the chasm and that's sort of what trapped all of the abyssal monsters down there but in order to do that they had to be trapped with it so that's when you find out that bosatius did die during this attempt to hold back you know the forces of of Conria that were infected. We knew that Bosatius was missing, but it's confirmed that he did die trapped in the bed of the chasm, protecting, even though he was stark raving mad during all of this, because he had already lost his mind, you know, thousands of years before then, he actually sprung back into action as bonkers Bosatius. <laughs> and protected Liyue from, you know, monsters coming out of the chasm and trapped them down in the, the bed of the chasm with that device. That's why I think Yelan, who is Boyang's ancestor, and Xiao, who's obviously connected to Posatius, were the ones that activate it to go back up out of the bed of the chasm. No, that makes a lot of sense, honestly. So then we realize that we're not going to make it out of this space elevator and Zhao is starting to lose his powers and he in that moment decides to sacrifice himself and he uses his teleportation power to teleport each of us one at a time out of the elevator and out of the chasm and then Zhao we see him fall the elevator crumbles around him we see a geo shard of sorts come and like wisp him away and the next thing we know he is awake with us on top of the chasm and wasn't it heartbreaking to see the, his face as he's falling and he just gets this look like he's accepting the fact that he's going to finally die yes and he says something in the chasm about how he has caused enough hurt and he's ready to finally do good something along those lines so he's definitely very depressed and ready to feel like he's done the right thing finally but then he uh, wakes up in the ca on top of the chasm with us near the Cinehome. Do you think he woke up kind of like, ah, crap. <laughs> I thought this was the end. <laughs> he's like, I thought I was done with this bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It's like, damn it. Or he's like, what type of hell is this? I'm right back where I started. Jesus. I need some almond tofu right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then Zhao opens up to us a little bit more. Tells us that his original name was Alatis. Which I thought, like you guys mentioned earlier, was really sweet and showed that even if Zhao doesn't have a crush on us, he's minimally more open to us. Right. He tells us more about the plight of the Yakshas at Pervasis's temple, which I thought was really sweet. And he wanted to go there to sort of pay respect because he reveals that Bosatius and Pervasis were close. And Bosatius was really sad when Pervasis died. Zhao has seen so much Hardy. I would say that in my head, he's probably in the top five saddest characters. Or saddest characters with a reason to be sad, you know? Yeah. There are some characters that seem really sad, and I'm like, oh, have you met Zhao? Have you met these other people? <laughs> of course, everyone has a right to feel their emotions. And I love Al's idea that it's a really powerful parallel for war veterans with PTSD, because he has literally been through thousands of years of war. Do you think they planned that when they were writing out the character? And yes and no, maybe? I think, I don't know. I would think so. I think the idea when we're looking at the old memories cutscene and Bosatius is like my brothers and sisters in arms, mm -hmm. like it, it definitely gives that veteran like camaraderie i don't know if that was like purposeful that mm -hmm. it is as parallel to ptsd or maybe i'm just reading real far into it but i would like it to be that they were purposely doing it i definitely think you could be right out and i think what's really wonderful about hoyoverse and i know that they have some weird stipulations because of where they're from and stuff with what they can exactly put in the game but all things considering they seem to be very progressive 
aggressive themselves as a company as much as they can be given their circumstances because we do have to remember everything is also being written with a china mindset because the game is based in china and i could definitely see them writing this for war veterans i mean the people in china have been fighting for quite some time for freedom in certain areas and i could see it being a homage to people they might even know yeah definitely but let's leave real sadness and go back into game sadness. So now Zhao has left the chasm. The, the whole perilous trail event kind of ends. So we now have a really interesting insight into the Yakshas. We've learned a little bit more about them and how they're very family-esque. And Zhao seems to miss that family. He's very sad. His brothers and sisters are gone. They used to draw on his face. They used to make fun of him. And I always felt like maybe he was the youngest of the five because of that. But I could be wrong. He definitely sees like the baby brother at first who then had to grow up real quick and become the old adult brother. It definitely seems that way. And maybe that's why he's an animo element because it feels like with animo, I mean, mine is our tall gene. There's a freeing aspect or like kind of, not a whimsical, but almost. Maybe it's because I can only think of Venti and how whimsical he can be. But he definitely does seem like the youngest when you're looking at the old memories cutscene. And he is, he's just napping and they're drawing on his face. Full Jigglypuff moment. <laughs> and he, he, he is the second shortest of the group minus uh who what is the name of the of the hydro oh the blue girl she's so cute bonanas yes i also i am all for bonanas and the pyro yaksha being lesbian lovers i love it i want to see more art of it because that looks great <laughs> I'm actually really happy that you brought up Venti and the Animo stuff. So I have two questions for you guys in regards to that. One, I heard rumor, and this was like through conversations with other Genshin players, that Zhao doesn't actually have a vision. Similar to the Archons, it is just a fake thing. He keeps on his waist to make it look normal to humans. Really? No, that's not true. I, that's oh. what I wanted to ask, because I also didn't agree with it. I felt like he definitely was gifted a vision, because not all the Adepti have visions. I think it's his character stories. One of them touches on that, and it says that he did get a vision, but he doesn't remember receiving it because it was so long ago, and he's fought so many battles since he received it. Awesome, okay. So it sort of explains, you know, that getting a, a vision to a human is a really big deal, but to a Yaksha, um, more important things on their mind. <laughs> I think it also makes sense that he would have been, like, Venti would have been able to give it to him at some point because he's met Venti. They're they're kind of old buds. Not old buds. They are unknown old buds. They don't realize... I think Venti realizes it. I'm not sure Zhao realizes it. They're husbands in my head. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. <laughs> For our travelers who may not... May be sitting here going, what the hell are they talking about? Basically, in Zhao's story, lines and i believe it's mentioned in his teaser trailer i think it's also mentioned in his overall story arc Zhao almost was overcome by his karmatic debt at one point and right when he felt like he was going to go under and he was going to succumb to it like his friends did he heard the beautiful noises of a flute now we don't know venti to be a flute player but in the trailer video they do show venti playing a flute and it's supposed to be canon basically that venti's music saves Zhao. yes it's also implied in writing in one of his character stories as well that it was a, that it was an archon that saved him that day and what do you guys think about that i definitely think venti knows what he did i'm not not sure if Zhao knows. I know that Zhongli and Venti seem to be goofy buds. I love that. I love that Uncle Venti sort of keeping tabs on him and looking out, you know, for his safety. Yeah, you know, when I was reading up on some stuff too, I thought it was interesting. I mean, and I, I guess it, maybe it kind of could even coincide with the idea of this of Venti, like you know, Zhongli being like, "Hey, Venti, come help this like little emo guy." <laughs> But I, I read that Zhang Li is the only one who's able to make a medicine that cures Zhao of his karmic debt, like when he gets the overwhelming sickness and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. So I wonder if that, you know, could it be like... <laughs> I almost have this like vision of like Jean Lee being like, I want to set up some candles and some <laughs> a flute player. <laughs> There's rose petals falling from <laughs> the sky. <laughs> I've gone a whole other route with this right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> 
Yeah, Zhang Li apparently is the one who can who can heal him, and maybe that's part of their contract. Is Zhang Li in a bubble bath when this is happening? <laughs> I hope so. It's like it's like the scene from The Witcher. It's like you know, <laughs> Zhao is Geralt, and Zhang Li is there rubbing this cure on his bum. It's like you need some chamomile oil. I love the idea that Morax owns a day spa. That's actually what he's doing in retirement as an archon. He's running a day spa. He would be making bank with that. Why he broke? Well, that's because he's not actually making any money and he's spending all of Hu Tao's money from the funeral parlor. I mean, maybe Venti's just taking all this money and spending it on wine. Probably. Also valid. So I do want to go now. We're talking a little bit about Zhang Li, about Hu Tao, about Ganyu. I want to talk a little bit about how Zhao has integrated into Li Wei society. So uh, from what we know, he hasn't, for the most part integrated into society he knows a few people he speaks fondly of hu tao which is you know one voice line has made me ship them for life but he lives at the or i don't know if he lives there if he just stays at the wang shu inn he lives there why so it is that he actually lives there it was the liwei chi sing who kind of got people together and actually made the washung inn specifically as a front to kind of be a place where zhao could be and do his business of, of, you know, keeping Liwei safe. So it's actually built into that building that is supposed to protect Zhao, allow him to come and go, and also be of some kind of assistance while he actually does his duties. Oh, that's really interesting. What? I had no idea. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I'm hoping to find a little bit more into it. Unfortunately, it seems to, I kept just rereading the same thing over and over again. But yeah, it seems to be um, a lot more, I hope at one point they get into that kind of a story if they you know if Zhao reruns and he gets another story quest or anything like that that they kind of go back into that further history because it'd be really interesting to see how that all kind of came about that's true also i was saying that that venti sucks dick whoa that was what my that was my in the chat when i said that that he plays some kind of flute I was, it was because oh I had to hold my mouth flute. because you're like, yeah, you know, I think, I think Venti knows how to play the flute. And my guy like, oh, yeah, does a skin flute. It was all coded language. It was all coded. La- like Zhao was like, I was about to die and someone played a flute. <laughs> I think that's how my, I got into that whole, that whole scenario in my head. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> Wait, I will say one of the reasons I, absolutely love the Zhao and Venti ship. One, the color palette is ah, beautiful, but also the fact that Zhao suffers from PTSD and Venti's music saved him is kind of like an illusion or like a nod to how music plays a really big part in PTSD therapy and recovery and helping people who are going through perhaps episodes and can't really be reached how music can sometimes be a key into like getting them back to reality like in stranger things exactly like it's just (laughs) benji's on his flute playing running up that hill and zhao's like (laughs) i can feel it (laughs) that's really interesting i didn't know that about ptsd therapy that and also owning snakes i don't like that one Owning snakes and watching snakes move can also be very therapeutic for PTSD sufferers. For some reason, their movement has a calming effect. And I love snakes, so I needed to put that out there. That's interesting, too, because Zhao has, like, a scaly-looking tattoo. I don't know. That's just... That's what I thought of. Anyway, the other way that Zhao seems to be kind of implementing back into society, he is being more engaged with the Adepti, and he's actually been asked to train Ganyu in her storyline. Not happily training Ganyu by any chance. I don't think he happily does anything, (laughs) even if he really truly is happy about it. He can't. He can't let people know. He also has a really interesting voice line about Ganyu. He says, Ganyu is neither mortal nor illuminated beast wandering both the mortal and adepti realms with duty as her sole guide it was inevitable that she would become perplexed what me you believe a yaksha who knows nothing more than how to massacre countless souls and emerge unscathed is a suitable mentor for such an individual your mind occupies a very different world from that that which your body inhabits so he first throws shade at us rude but he also mentions these illuminated beasts and the adepti are illuminated beasts i believe 
Yes. Yes. To my understanding, both Adepti and Yakshas are illuminated beasts. Okay. It's just that the Adeptus went the path of animal and the Yaksha went more human form with the masks that kind of still actually bring it back to some animal like characters. Okay, got it. Which, just speaking of the masks, just for a little side thing, I think it's neat that, you know, obviously the developers of the game being in China, they're obviously their culture is going to fall into the story, whether, kind of whether they like it or not. But as somebody who doesn't know a lot of like the ins and outs, it was very interesting to see that those masks are a nod to the Nuo opera, which is China's most popular popular folk operas um and mm -hmm. if if you're not familiar with it go definitely take a look at the site we're gonna put a couple pictures up of there and as soon as you see them you're gonna be like oh that's right i i have seen those they're very iconic i want that oh my god i love mask shit anthropologists coming out right now just like oh my god is it bad that my automatic reaction was like do you like the mask singer <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Not, I don't watch it, but that was like my first thought process. Anyway, <laughs> Amandaisms aside. So Zhao has now started to assimilate into society, which really brings me to like, what is next for our little emo angst boy who's trying to like become normal-ish? And like, I know at the end of the Perilous Trails event, he mentions that he was going to try to start hanging out with people more because people with visions are not as susceptible to the karmatic debt so he feels like he can actually hang out with them which my first thought was hell yeah he's gonna hang out with hu tao but i'm biased and i know that so what do you think is gonna come of our of our little zhao our little buddy as ito would call him he's going to go to monstat during the wind bloom festival of of 2023 <laughs> He and Venti are gonna r go on the town and drink everything from from the cat's tail to, to angel share and then maybe raid Deluxe the wine cellar. I would love to see that. <laughs> I want that. I want it so bad. Where Venti just takes him around and sort of forces him to have fun. He's like, I'm I'm your archon. I gave you that vision. We're doing it. Exactly. It's like you owe me one, so we're gonna have fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw something that Venti just keeps stealing the other Archon's children. <laughs> which, you know, As I will, should. As I won't say should. anything more because some of you will, some travelers will know what that means and some won't. So if you know, you know. If you don't. Wait, wait. I don't think I know. <laughs> like, That's for me. <laughs> is this a Peter Pan reference? Oh, no. I'll, I'll tell you when this is done. Oh, no. I don't want to spoil too many people. Including me. Oh, no. Jesus Christ, guys. <laughs> you guys obviously don't look at twitter look i only follow a twitter account that has leaks but we promise not to put leaks in here so i'm <laughs> i won't say who it's me no <laughs> it is um, Feeny. it is Feeny. she's the one leaking everything so what i'd really like to see from zhao is i would like to see him be able to start cutting loose i don't know what that means though i do believe that they're probably going to do another lantern right this year or not this year but in the next maybe year you know lantern right seems to be a go-to for them event wise and i'd like to see zhao maybe be in leeway instead of being at the wangshu inn maybe he's hanging out with zhongli and hu tao and he does love zhongli like a father minimally and he seems to get along with hu tao who has a vision perhaps he could spend it with god on you as well i mean he has options i'd like to see him actually enjoy himself my hope for him is closer to the end of the whole game that he plays some kind of pivotal role in saving like a bunch of people or a nation or something that sort of catches him up a lot faster on his karmic debt um and that he can sort of release some of that negative energy that way so like what you mean is when Bosatius remembers who he is, his goal is to make the ultimate sacrifice. You're saying that that's also Zhao's ultimate goal? No, not to sacrifice himself. I mean, to save a bunch of people. To like, you know what I mean? Because he's been killing and he has this karmic debt from all of the, the murdering that he's done, all the slaughtering. So if he can save, like the more good he does, the more it balances the scales for him. So and sort of that. eases that karmic debt. So I would love to see him do something. He, I mean, he already kind of did because he fought the battle at the end of Liyue. But I would love to see him be solely responsible for saving like a shit ton of people. <laughs> 
oh, I'm, I want it now. I'm like, it, oh, it's Zhao and like a bunch of other people at the very end of the game. And he just saves as many people as possible. Oh my God. Yeah, like they're, you know, they're about to like destroy Liyue Harbor or something and he single-handedly stops it. That would be great. <laughs> destroy the harbor for the third time. I was just gonna yeah. say for the third Again. time. <laughs> <laughs> That harbor is never going to get a break, honestly. Nope. Never. I think that Conria is going to rise out of Leeway Harbor. <laughs> no, I don't think that at all. But that'd be fun. I did want to say as well, when we are listening to Dainsleaf narrate the one teaser trailer for Zhao, he does have a voice line where he says, I know the Adepti suffer a heartache just like I do, but I cannot know Zhao's future. Dainsleaf is like empathizing with Zhao. I don't like that was really weird for me. Dainsleaf has never necessarily empathized with another character so far from the episodes that we've recorded. And I can think of most recently in my head. So I find it interesting that Dainsleaf is empathizing with him. Do we think they know each other? I don't know if we went in. I don't know how much we went into this during the the episode in which we discussed a lot of Dainsleaf lore, but the uh, the Black Sword and I forget the name of the artifact set, but it's something knight. Something. Is it the Bloodstained? That sounds right. Bloodstained yeah. Chivalry? Bloodstained Chivalry because it's talking about the Bloodstained Knight. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, and it and it basically implies that Dainsleaf, Dainsleaf was sort of seduced by the power of the sword or these artifacts, and he basically became a killing machine himself. Thought he started out doing it for the good of Mondstadt or, or the area, and then it got kind of carried away. And at some point, he sort of realized by looking at you know blood splattered on a flower for some maiden that like what he had become, and that sort of is what led him to to sort of go soul searching and to Conria. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really cool because some of the language used made it seem like an outsider led him there, which made me think that it could have been the Traveler, like our sibling. I'm not, not the Traveler, I'm sorry. Traveler's sibling. Um, so I thought that was something really interesting. I don't know if we actually touched on that at all, but... No, we didn't. It's a new... Th it's a theory that there is a theory that Dangsleaf is actually from Mondstadt. <gasps> I would love that. That would make sense too why they like, I don't want to get too off topic from the Yakshas, but I think that would make sense that they decided to leave Kaya in Mondstadt as well if they were familiar with the people of Mondstadt. And it would also make sense if Kunria was very close to Mondstadt, which we assume mm -hmm. that it is. Yeah. But this is sort of why I think that he may have said this quote about suffering heartache because the Yakshas are killing machines that have to sort of live with the burden of what they've done. And if that theory about Dainsley was true, he sort of had the same path to a lesser degree. Right. That's very true. I want it to be true. But then again, I want every theory to be true. <laughs> Look, <laughs> give me the trauma, but also the very cute, lovable shit too. I need, I want it. Hoyo, come on. Is there anything <laughs> else? Else you guys would like to add um, about Zhao and the Yakshas? I will say, at first, I don't know if this is just the Mandela effect or I had a fever dream. I always thought the, the Yaksha with the forearms was the Geo Yaksha because that would have made sense in my brain. But apparently, no, it's, it's both H's, the Electro Yaksha. And I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, why does he have forearms? There's probably something specific about about the forearms. And I just, you know, it would be great if we got to see more of the Yaksha lore through Zhao and him being able to tell us more about because we know a lot about Bosatius, but we don't know about the other three who unfortunately succumbed to the karmatic debt. I would love to know more. And I want there to yeah. be confirmation that the two ladies were, you know, married and wives. Like let's I want that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a hot take. My favorite Yaksha is not Xiao, it's Pervases. Ooh. Oh, why? Because I loved that quest with him where he's introduced so much, where it's during Zhao's story quest where you're getting vengeance on this person calling himself Star Snatcher, who's basically a fraud. And Zhao was like, we're going to do this ritual to teach him a lesson. And part of that is you have to go... You mean Snatch Sniffer? Yeah, and, and part of that is you have to go and uh, gather supplies from this rundown temple. And in that temple, you run into Pervases, who died a thousand years ago. 
and his soul has been lingering in this crane statue and he uh his spirit did a ritual to appear a thousand years after his death so he could see modern leeway and he actually like once we talk to him and he sort of tells us a story he allows us to take these items from his temple which makes him disappear and it's like he did this to show up, you know, in modern day leeway so we could see what was going on. And he's just like letting us take this to go be of service to Zhao. And I thought that was so nice. And then you get the nice moment where Star Snatcher is redeemed later and he's actually rebuilding the temple to Pervases. Right. And like adding the incense and everything. And it was just such a nice moment. He just seems so sweet. I love me some Pervases. Well, travelers, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us as we talked about the Yakshas and Zhao and shared in some emo angst together while also maybe being a little sad. Next week, we're going to be talking about Kale, who first showed up in the Genshin manga and now is one of the first characters we meet when we enter Sumeru and is a character you all should be playing as, or at least have, because we've gotten her free multiple times already. So join us next week to talk about Kale and her world story. Otherwise, safe journeys, travelers. Bye, nerds.